there is a theory I'm developing with collaborators that we're using for life detection, which is called assembly theory, it was first developed for detecting alien life. But the way we think about it, if you take something like a molecule or a person, we would say in this theory that they're an assembly space. For a molecule, it's very easy to visualize. So you take a molecule, if you break it in half and you break it in half again and break it in half again, you can get to elementary building blocks. And then you can take those and try to reassemble them. Like imagine you have a stack of red and blue Legos um, and you take them apart and then you want to build, find all the ways to be, reassemble that original object. In assembly theory, those more complex objects have longer and longer shortest paths for assembling them. And so we talk about the shortest path to make something as being an intrinsic feature of the objects. And then the argument is that if you had if you see a complex object and it requires too many minimal steps for the universe to produce it, then it's a signature that you had a living process there or something that had information or knowledge about how to make that specific object. Welcome to the Pretty Intense Podcast. Today is pretty intense. On the show is Sarah Walker. She is an astrobiologist and a theoretical physicist. She is interested in the origin of life. Where did we come from? How are we here? And potentially life on other worlds learned by understanding ourselves. So before this started, I told my producer, I was like, this is getting to the edges of my intelligence, meaning like we crossed over that quite a few times. Um, but I don't think there's any other way to learn other than getting outside of what you already know. So today was a very interesting enlightening, confusing conversation about life and how it came to be exploring concepts of biology, quantum physics, uh, time. Um, that's something that's really interesting to her is this relate our relationship to time. And if time exists, and that's what ends up being the sort of the causal causal platform to create life and universes and everything. And so yeah, I mean, if you're into science or how life evolved, you're going to enjoy today and you're going to be left thought provoked. And I think that's the best place to be, because if there's one thing that is the truth about scientists is that it's an endless list of questions uh, without answers. And the goal is, is that you figure a couple of them out in your life. And so at the end, I ask her what that question is that she'd like figured out. I hope you enjoy the show. If you like what you hear today and have maybe listened to other ones and like those, please hit the subscribe. It means a lot to me. And also, if you have any thoughts in the comments, I'm going to be reading those because this is a fascinating topic. Enjoy. What happened when you were a kid that you're like, I want to understand what life is. I love figuring out stuff that no one knows. Um, I don't think I knew that when I was a kid. Actually, when I was young, I wanted to be an artist because um, my dad's a hairstylist and my mom uh, does interior decorating. And I just came from a very sort of creative artistic family. But I think what really got me into physics was actually I was at community college and I was just interested in science. So I took all the science classes and I was so deeply fascinated by the fact that uh, human minds could come up with ideas about how reality worked, write them as mathematical equations, make predictions, and then go and find these things that we just never anticipated could be there. Um, so the example was my favorite was magnetic monopoles, which sounds kind of silly, but every magnet that we've ever come across has a North and South pole. So a simple idea is could you have an isolated North or South pole? And there's these objects in particle physics that have been predicted that people are looking for. And I was just like, that is so romantic. Um, so, so that was it for me was just the fact that, you know, we can think so deeply about things and actually look for them. This is actually something I've observed with a lot of people that have discovered brilliant things. And that is, there is almost like an awareness for a dynamic Mm -hmm. that you then spend years or decades backing into yeah. the reality, the way to the, an equation for it. It just seems like this is a pattern. Do you, is there, and does that ring a bell? And if it does, then is there something that was happening in your reality, in your world where you thought, I just, 
I know this is the case. I want to figure it out. Yeah, except I think this is exactly as you described where you don't know what it is um, right away and you start to realize that over time. So for me, um, I became deeply um, infatuated in a sense with theoretical physics and the the sort of um, beauty of the theories that came before and um, and the fact that you know we could do this, we could write down equations. And so I thought for um, my undergrad and my starting grad work that I wanted to be a particle physicist or a cosmologist because I thought those kind of physicists studied the most fundamental things, right? So you learn about quantum physics and general relativity and you're like, that's it, that's what it is. But what was interesting was my PhD advisor was interested in the origins of life and he wanted me to work on a project in that. So actually what I did as I started working on it because I thought I could just work with him and then I would gradually get into those deeper questions. But what I realized was, um, you know, thinking about the problem of life and how life arises in the universe is um, this really open scientific question. Nobody had an idea about how to address that question and what kind of theories we should be thinking about to explain what life is. And for me, that became, you know, really sort of the signature of the kind of science I wanted to do because I was looking at past generations and what they had done. But of course, those theories are, are they're not complete. They're always subject to revision, but they're about parts of things we know. And here was this frontier of what we didn't know. And if I wanted to be one of those theoretical physicists working on the edge of what we didn't know, here was the problem. Um, and so, so then, then I realized that working on life was actually the way to fulfill doing fundamental physics for me because it was at that creative boundary. And then um, as I worked on that problem more, I've come to do this sort of set of thought experiments I really like, which is, you know, uh, there's theoretical physics where we write math equations and we use them to describe the world. And then I like to look at that from the outside being somebody studying life. And I, and I think about it in some sense, what would be the physics that describes theoretical physicists? You know, what is the physics of people or minds in the universe trying to understand the universe? That's, in effect, physics of life, right? So, so then that goes back to the original motivation. I had to be a physicist in the first place because what really caught my interest was this correspondence between our ability to comprehend nature and the fact that nature is comprehensible. Um, and I, I think there's some, some really deep physics we don't understand about that structure yet. Mm. What do we understand about nature at this point? And what, what, what have been the most recent discoveries even about nature? Um, and are we talking about nature, meaning like trees and bushes and stuff, or are we talking? No, about I mean reality. Reality, reality yeah. yeah. So maybe that's a better word. We're talking about yeah. reality, yeah. Um, <laughs> the big end, <laughs> nature. Um, yeah. Um, what are the most recent? I'm, I mean, I can tell you about the things I'm excited from my work, but um, but I think it's a very sort of non-traditional kind of physics. So um, so I think one of the things I find interesting and challenging is. Um, you know, there's sort of a standard doctrine in the way that we talk about physics as it's been invented over the last 300 years. So I think people forget that physics itself is a creation of the human mind. Mm -hmm. And it required a lot of ingenuity of people uh, like Galileo and Newton, for example, to actually come up with sort of the first real theories of physics. So one of the first major theories in physics is obviously like the theory of gravitation. um, And it was ex- exceptionally powerful and it's explanatory power because it basically, for the first time in human history, we understood that the motions that we see in the night sky can be described by the same things as we see on earth. Um, And I think people really don't even appreciate the fact that for most of human history, we thought the heavens were governed by different principles and different laws than, than things here on earth. Um, So that was a huge conceptual leap, a huge amount of creativity to come up with those kind of theories, but they have a certain structure to them because they were explaining things like gravitation or motion. Um, And, you know, so if you want to build a theory that tells you about how all objects move in the universe from, you know, uh, the pen I'm going to drop on the floor to, you know, you and I sitting in our chair to a a startling satellites moving across the night sky or, or planets, you know, all these things are described by common laws, but it doesn't mean that the structure of those laws actually describes other phenomena that we observe, um, like life. The simplest way I can describe the sort of dichotomy is actually to go to a quote from Charles Darwin, which is a very famous one, which where he talks about whilst, um, you know, the planets have been moving around the sun uh, due to the con- constant law of gravity, um, endless forms most wonderful are being evolved and continue to be evolved. I, I botched the quote, but I think, you know, he wasn't a very eloquent writer, but that was probably one of the most eloquent things he ever wrote. There's this structure for the laws of physics um, that we assume the laws exist outside the universe and they're fixed for all time. And, 
and that was kind of Newton's concept because he believed in sort of an external being that might have written down the laws of nature and actually set the universe in motion. And Darwin is kind of making this argument against that kind of conception of the laws of nature, because when you look at biology, you're constantly seeing change and innovation and creativity in the biosphere right. that you don't, you don't see in gravitating systems or in quantum physics. Um, and so what I'm interested in is what is the structure of that creative process in the universe, the thing that we call life. Um, yeah. And I think it has a very different kind of physics. And in fact, the, the kind of work that I'm doing with my collaborators really suggests that we should think about time as being more fundamental. And some of these other properties is emergent of time in the sense that certain things in the universe don't exist unless other things existed before them. So I would say like mm -hmm. my cell phone is the product of 4 billion years of evolution on earth. They don't spontaneously fluctuate into existence because quantum mechanics tells us they do. That's just, that's a wrong extrapolation of that theory um, to explain the complexity of this object. It actually requires a specific causal chain of information being acquired in the universe about how to build a cell phone, which is what we call the evolution of the biosphere. We're using this phone to communicate with each other at sort of this density and reality of existence. But if we look to something like quantum entanglement or telepathy or remote viewing or all those kinds of things, like you don't actually need the telephone. They just are kind of local to this experience. Yeah. So certain ones of those, I might say, I were more reliable phenomena in the sense that you could sure. set up experimentally boundary conditions and test it. Um, but I would say a general feature of that kind of thing um, from the, the way that I might talk about that kind of phenomena from the perspective of thinking about living things is um, that they actually are connected by a causal sequence of events. So there is a theory I'm developing with collaborators that we're using for life detection, which is called assembly theory. Um, and um, well, it was first developed for detecting alien life. Um, but the way we think about it um, is actually deeply related to answering your question from the perspective that I think about it, um, which is if you take something like a molecule or a person, um, we would say, um, uh, in this theory that they're an assembly space for a molecule. It's very easy to visualize. So you take a molecule, if you break it in half and you break it in half again and break it in half again, you can get to elementary building blocks and then you can take those and try to reassemble them. So think like Legos, like imagine you have a stack of blue, red and blue yellows, Legos, sorry, red and blue Legos in a stack um, mm -hmm. and you take them apart and then you want to build, find all the ways to be, reassemble that original object. Um, and assembly theory, the way we talk about a molecule is a molecule is actually all of those pathways for building it, but you can't see them unless you actually look at it across time. Um, and this becomes important um, because when you look at that, that let's say you built um, not a, a really simple stack, stack of Legos, which if you had some random kinetic motion, you might maybe expect to spontaneously self-assemble. But let's say you're like my son and you really like Harry Potter and you built like the Hogwarts castle, what's the likelihood of you being able to assemble that object? And this is where we say, you know, the likelihood of that particular configuration is very low. Um, in assembly theory, those more complex objects have longer and longer shortest paths for assembling them. And so we talk about the shortest path to make something as being an intrinsic feature of the object. So, um, and then the argument is that if you had if you see a complex object and it requires too many minimal steps for the universe to produce it, then it's a signature that you had a living process there or something that had information or knowledge about how to make that specific object. Now, this gets important to answering your question, because if I have a set of objects like people, um, what it suggests is they're, they're not independent phenomena. So one of the reasons I was laughing about the idea of a phone spontaneously fluctuating out of the quantum vacuum is I don't think a human could ever emerge in isolation in the universe. They always emerge in groups or populations because there's a set of causal constraints that's actually generating the phenomena we call humans. And they're connected in their past by this set of ways that the universe could make them this sort of assembly space. And you can actually look at the causal constraints in that space and say how likely it is to get this set of objects. So when I think about people, I don't necessarily think about us as individuals. I think of us as sort of um, uh, a lineage of this kind of information structuring matter across time and that we're connected in, in across time in a really interesting and fundamental and physical way. And that may manifest, um, so for example, an entanglement if you thought 
time had a physical dimension in the same way that space has a physical dimension, it'd be very easy to say that those things are actually con connected more fundamentally um, in terms of being having been localized in time and space is this emergent property that makes them look like they're separated. And this is something that happens in sort of causal set theories for quantum gravity, the way I talk about it, which is supposed to be one explanation for quantum gravity. But um, so, so, so I guess my, my short answer is, I don't think it's impossible for us to have some understanding and overlap uh, with each other in a sense that even when we speak language, right? Language is a weird thing to think about as a physical object. Like what is a word as a physical thing? Yeah. Uh, and the reason that we can communicate is because we share a common history because mm -hmm. we're part of the same lineage. We're, we're part of the same example of life in the Got universe it. connected by this causal story of life evolving over 4 billion years. Well, why do they, I mean, I would imagine that this is, this theory is intriguing and could be really powerful is because from all the things that I read and learn about is that people say that in the quantum field or in the universe time, this is, a, we're in a time space reality and that in outside of this time space reality, there isn't time anymore and everything exists simultaneously. Yeah. Why, where does that come from? What is the actual science that they're implying when they say that time does not exist? Um, yeah, I actually, is there any, no, I, so I, I think, um, so here, so, so the thing that I think people have a hard time grasping up about physics, and this is even true for practicing physicists and some of the best physicists in the world is that physics is you know, a set of theories that describe to best approximation certain phenomena we see in the world, and they can suggest features of our reality that are imperceptible to us. Like, for example, the fact that I'm sitting in a curved uh, space-time uh, geometry right now because I'm a massive body attracted to another massive body, right? Like, that's, I, I can't perceive that with my sensory perception, but I can infer that based on being an intelligent being. I think the, the thing is, like, how far can we extrapolate the theories? And, and then the question I have related to that is, when do you decide that your extrapolation is non-physical? And I, th because it doesn't conform to other features that you observe that maybe you don't have an explanation for. And the places where you see this come up mo most clearly are where say fundamental physics interacts with everyday experience or intuition. Um, and there are real conflicts there. Like, you know, people that study um, physics and want to, you know, explain everything in terms of the structure of the standard model will say there's no room for free will because the standard model explains everything uh, because it explains what your elementary particles are doing. So therefore you and I don't exist. We're just epiphenomena. And I, I don't think, um, I don't think that's adequate because it, it doesn't explain a lot of features of our experience. And so the point about time is there are certain models of the universe that time doesn't exist. And in standard physics, time needs to be an emergent property. Um, it's not a fundamental property. Um, and so, so what people do um, is they, they spend a lot of time trying to show how time emerges from fundamental physics. Um, and some of the places that might come up are thinking about, um, you know, entropy, like the increase in disorder of the universe has a certain directionality to it, mm -hmm. um, or, um, you know, actually having a process be irreversible in, in an entropic sense. So, so these are, these are certain ways of trying to show that there should be a directionality in time, but there's also other senses you could think about time. There's the flow of time, which is our perception of time. So that's mm -hmm. psychological. And then when I talk about time, I actually mean the ordering of events that can happen, mm -hmm. um, which is another concept of time. And when, when I was talking about this sort of idea of thinking of ourselves as these assembly structures, like these, these causal structures of, you know, like I, I exist in the universe in, in sort of theory we're thinking about um, as all of the ways the universe could assemble Sarah. I'm a unique object in the universe, but I, I contain a lot of uh, baggage, if you will, but like a lot of history, right? I'm a, you know, I, 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 I've been, I've been generated in this universe over 4 billion years of evolution of life on earth. Um, and, um, and time becomes fundamental when you're thinking about that, because there is a clear ordering that, um, you know, I couldn't be born before my grandmother. It's a, it's a causal impossibility. Mm -hmm. um, and I think, mm -hmm. um, you know, there's some paradoxes in, in relativity associated with that, that get resolved by certain features of that theory. But I think what, 
when I think about relativity, I don't think about relativity as being a theory that actually talks about time. I think it's a theory that talks about simultaneity. And I think part of the problem with all of these concepts is we're all using the same words, but words are imprecise to reality. And we, we slightly construe them based on our perceptions of what we think they mean. And then we get in these kind of, uh, narratives where people are using the same words in different ways, and then it becomes very confused what's happening. Um, and that happens in science among, you know, some of the best experts in the world don't always know what each other are talking about when they use certain words like time or space. Well, space is a little bit easier. Space is actually much easier. Um, but then, you know, when we talk about it popularly, it also becomes, uh, you know, quite different. And and I think it's important to be aware of the fact that when you're working on the boundary, that some of these concepts may not really be understood in the way that we think we understand them. Is there some kind of intersection between um, perhaps the past or even the future and time based on, and so I'm just kind of riffing here. I have no right. astrophysicist. I am just a curious Curious you're girl. alive, which means you have some window into the physics of life. <laughs> I suppose. Um, but this, we're hurling through space. Like we're not sitting idle, right? The whole thing is expanding. We're expanding, we're spinning, we're hurling through space. We're moving. So is there some kind of motion happening in the universe where our positioning intersects with other sort of energetic time codes that have happened at other times, not meaning that time didn't happen. Yeah. It's just an, it's just intersections of them. Um, to an extent, yes. I'll give you one of my favorite examples of this, which is a very concrete science example, but it goes back to this idea of thinking about the physics of theoretical physics physicists, which is um, to think about the example of first contact with gravitational waves. So a lot of people are interested in first contact with aliens. What will they look like? Will they be, you know, on a different planet? Will it be some interdimensional thing if you're getting a little bit more speculative, but you know, like what will that first contact be like? And my argument for thinking about making contact with other life forms is we have to have an understanding of what we are and what we're looking for before we design the technology capable of making contact. Um, and part of the argument actually comes from just thinking about the structure of the evolution of our understanding of gravitational physics um, in the sense that, you know, I, I gave the example of Newton, you know, unifying terrestrial and celestial motion and then Einstein unified space and time, right, in his conception of gravity. Um, and what he was able to predict from that was this thing called gravitational waves, right? So gravitational waves are ripples in the fabric of space-time. If you didn't invent a concept of space-time, you would never fathom these things could exist. They're ripples in the fabric of space-time, but gravity is very weak force. So they're very tiny ripples. Um, and what happened was Einstein put that idea out there and people thought it was plausible because of all the other predictions relativity made, but we weren't able to detect that particular feature. And it took a hundred years for us to build an interferometer, which is a very sensitive instrument. They're four kilometers across. Um, they can detect vibrations of a proton on the scale of, you know, like a fraction of a proton. I think it's like a 10,000th the width of a proton. They can detect perturbations, do the rippling of the fabric of space time. And um, in 2015, I think it was, or 17, I always get it mixed up. Um, uh, we actually detected a black hole merger that happened in our universe. Now that black hole merger was an event that happened 1.4 billion years ago in the history of our universe because it was 1.4 billion light years away. And those ripples have been propagating across our universe for 1.4 billion years. And it is only because we happen to be a planet that evolved intelligence, that intelligence identified certain regularities in the world and formalized them in laws of physics and developed technology to measure properties of those physics, that when that 1.4 billion year ago event happened to intersect our timeline, we actually could measure that phenomena happening. But what was happening on Earth at that time was we weren't even multicellular. We were just, you know, microbes on this planet when that event happened in, in the past of the universe. So that's an intersection of some really interesting things that have happened in our universe, the evolution of intelligence detecting this event um, and actually recording it, right? So, mm -hmm. um, so I think I think you know you can extrapolate that as you will to what kinds of things we might find in the future. But I think one thing that's very clear is if you have physical systems that are capable of generating knowledge, as humans are and our biosphere is, 
um, it causes really interesting intersections between what happens in space and time and what gets picked up basically by sensory apparatus or detectors or things. So, mm. um, so you were talking about, you know, us beginning as biological systems and producing us. Yes. Um, my understanding is that life started pretty quickly on earth. Yes. That's what we think. Yes. And so Obviously, evidence is in favor of an early start. <laughs> yeah. How is that possible? What, what are the ingredients to make that make to make life? Yeah. So, um, a lot of people that work on origins of life, which is the area of research that I, I spend most of my time thinking about is actually like, how does life even come to be in the universe? Um, think about, you know, trying to generate an individual cell um, and making some of the molecules that are involved in biology now. Um, and I think, I think that's not really the right way of framing the problem. I like to think about the origin of life much more as a planetary phenomena, that some planets actually transition into this cascade of open-ended complexity and mm -hmm. evolution that we call a biosphere. Um, and some planets don't, they just get stunted um, early on. Um, and then it has something to do with the geochemical complexity of that world. Like what were the chemical ingredients on that planet? How were they being mixed? What was the density? I, I think of it like a density in, in this sort of assembly space. What was the causal density of sure. like, and then amount density of information to actually generate this kind of very, um, uh, this very different kind of process and this different kind of physics that we see in life. And well, so I watched Cosmos and Neil deGrasse yeah. Tyson showed just how fragile life is. Yes, it is. Um, well, actually, I, you know, I, 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 it's interesting when you're working on this problem so much, I come to disagree with a lot of the standard doctrine. I don't actually think that life is that fragile. I think life is one of the most robust features of our universe uh, when it evolves. Oh. Because if you think about... Um, I mean, it is, we are fragile in the sense, like if a meteor hit the earth, you know, sure. it could potentially, right. But we're not fragile in the sense that um, we are capable of inventing technologies that can get us onto other planets and also allow us to live in air conditioned homes at a comfortable temperature that we don't have to fend for food. And biology has been constantly innovating to basically increase its staying power over, you know, 4 billion years. Um, so uh, so I think, I think if you think about the most kind of robust processes that can exist in the universe, I think intelligence is probably it as far as we know. Um, whereas all, all other sort of events in the universe that we understand from standard physics require specially tuned initial conditions and some kind of ran, random chance of events. Um, mm. like, uh, so, but intelligence is very reliable. If I know how to do something, I can do it again and I can do it again and again. If you say intelligence, are you talking about consciousness or are you talking about biological objects ability to have a feedback loop that perpetuates growth and evolution to some extent i might be talking about both um and again this goes to the fact the feature i was talking about earlier so i'm glad that you're asking about word choices because i think that's very perceptive of you um that um because the words are always imperfect. <laughs> they're, they're not they're very the best. Yeah, they're not the best. I wish we could communicate a different way than language, but we're not there yet. Consciousness, like, as I understand it as a scientist, like the feature of consciousness that's always mysterious and the one that you really want to understand is why we experience the world, right? So, so usually in the scientific community, we separate intelligence or even thinking about neuroscience from the problem of consciousness, because consciousness is in this sort of special bin where we're not sure that it actually can be addressed scientifically. Because, mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I'm having a certain set of experiences of this conversation right now, and you are too, but there, there doesn't seem to be any direct way of building a map between what my experience is and your experience, or even directly testing you have experience, because you, mm -hmm. you can tell me you're having experience, but how do I validate and how do I look at the mm -hmm. inner structure of your experience from the outside? It's, mm -hmm. it's not, um, it's, it's not, um, it's not that it's a, it's a well-posed problem, but it's not necessarily well-posed for science. And mm -hmm. sometimes, you know, uh, when I think about the long-term future, um, you know, pending we survive long enough, there, there might be something beyond science, not in, like, like science was invented, right. And it's a really rigorous way of thinking about reality, but there might be some ways of thinking that are even better than sciences that allow us to probe that question directly. Sure. I mean, Neil deGrasse Tyson said that the his greatest fear was that 
he didn't know the right question to ask. Yes. Yeah. No, that's a, that's a, a, that's very good. I also agree, but on the the nature of consciousness, I do think there are ways of thinking about it from the outside, what might be happening on the inside. And the way I think about that is to say, like, if you thought about imagination as something that you want to explain from physics, um, imagination is kind of a weird thing, right? So um, the example I like to give is like rockets. The idea of rockets have existed on this planet for hundreds of years, but we only were able to build them in the last century. So is that an example of something that existed only within minds and maybe minds writing on paper, but then was actually physically generated in the universe because those minds had access to that idea. They invented that idea before they generated right. physical structure. So I think when, when or I'm, was there two, two options? Did you so the, the, well, I think, no, I think that's what, like, I think that's a good probe into what the nature of, of consciousness is. And I also like to think of consciousness um, more in terms of sets of collective interactions. So I have a colleague in Japan, Takashi Ikigami, who, you know, was trying to play around with the idea of whether consciousness was contagious, which I think is kind of an interesting concept. Could you learn consciousness from interacting with another physical system? So in the context of like, could we teach robots to be conscious by interacting with us in a meaningful interaction? Um, but I, and that raised for me interesting questions about are we only conscious, like even though consciousness is an internal thing, maybe we're only experiencing consciousness because it's actually a collective property. It, has, it requires groups of minds interacting because it's actually about the information we exchange with each other that actually is our conscious awareness. Mm-hmm. So, um, so I think those are all sort of plausible ways of maybe formalizing theories of consciousness that could be tested. Um particularly the imagination when like, if you imagine that counterfactuals, things I could imagine could exist, but don't exist now could be caused to exist by an entity that could, you know, a physical thing like me that can invent them. I mean, the reason I think about it this way is exactly what you do when you're trying to make a theory of reality, right? So when, when you're trying to sit down and you're trying to say, I'm looking at all of the patterns that I see across all life, all the ways that we talk about it. And I'm trying to make an abstraction, a set of ideas that allows us to now control that phenomena, <laughs> not control it, but like actually understand it in a way that we can now use it for right. different things. And, and gravity again is the example, like why can we watch that satellite launch satellites into space right now? We can do it because we looked at a certain set of patterns in the world and we were able to come up with this abstraction that explains a large class of them, all the things that are gravitationally interacting. And then we use that to, to develop technology to be able to do things we were never able to do in our history. Uh, same thing with time. I mean, like the invention of clocks and the progression of our ability to use clocks and keep track of time. I mean, seconds we take for granted now. It's like, you know, seconds are passing when we're doing things. But for most of human history, the idea of a second was impossible because they had no no idea, no capacity to keep a record of a second. I, I start to think about whether or not anything can be objective. What do we define as objective? And yeah. then can we make a case that anything is even objective if it's collective if that's how we build build systems or theories like if that's how consciousness has grown there's nothing i mean it seems hard to make anything actually objective so i i I mean you would enjoy our upcoming workshop in the beyond center because i have a workshop i'm organizing in april which is called i'm here i'm local yeah infinite turtles or ground truth right so does reality actually have a bottom level or is it just turtles all the way down okay let's start with objective what is an objective truth how do we actually qualify something as truly objective so I don't think we can do that, um, but I I would say that for me as a physicist, I operationally, I have to assume something's objective because you have to build a scaffold from something you believe to be true to construct ideas about what would follow from that, that set of things being true. Um, and so... So I, I can think about this sort of, again, it goes to like thinking about life, right? So so life has evolved, you know, over this history on our planet, and we're continually evolve and acquire new knowledge. Um, and so for me, it's the knowledge that actually matters is the, the knowledge that um, stays, like it persists over time, because it actually has some correspondence with the mm-hmm. real reality out there. Um, and the real causal structure out there, because it's basically how we move through what exists. Okay. Um, so, so I think of it like uh, the trajectory of life as moving through the possibility space of everything that could exist, but it's very constrained by what exists now and what we can actually generate from that. And part of how we generate what is happening in the 
tech, technosphere, like all technology that exists on our planet today and what might exist in the future is actually imprinted in some sense in what exists now and what we can actually generate from that knowledge. So it is subjective to us. It's subjective, but it's also objective. So our subjective perceptions of things becomes objective because we're real physical systems and we use that subjective understanding to do things. Um, and unless that subjective understanding actually has any correspondence with reality, it's kind of useless information and it gets lost in the sort of evolutionary filter because it just doesn't persist over time. Yeah. It doesn't have staying power. It doesn't mean yeah. it. it means less and less all the time. Yeah. So, um, so if you, I mean, if you look at, you know, what ideas have persisted over thousands of years, I think ge geometry, I mean, I know I'm using a lot of mathematical examples, but like the idea of a triangle, I mean, it's a simple mm -hmm. object. We all learn about it in grade school. I mean, a triangle had to be invented by humans. We didn't have a concept of triangles. We, we had to invent it and we did it by, you know, it's, it's fascinating to me to think about the, the, um, invention of geometry based on like surveying the physical landscape of the earth. True. And sometimes I wonder like how much perception of like spatial awareness did we like our brains had to evolve that understanding of space. And then we regularized it by inventing something called geometry. And then that allowed us to understand that there could be, you know, things that didn't conform to flat geometries, for example, mm -hmm. and imagine mm -hmm. all kinds of things mm -hmm. that allow us to do all kinds of crazy stuff now. Um, <laughs> But, but all of that has to acquire over time and then it, it, you know, it stays in the system. And so the history of the evolution of our planet is very contingent on you know, what, what has been thought in the past and what we're thinking now is gonna really matter to the future, um, which is- So I don't, I don't disagree. I mean, that, that makes sense. I mean, that's how you build yeah. a system. That's how a, something biological evolves is that there has to be some kind of objective truths that it keeps building on. Right. But is there a chance that, I guess that's not, that's not the right way to start it with this, right? Cause there's yeah, a chance right. for about everything, but so I, yeah, I mean, I, there's always a chance. Right. And I think the, the question for me is always what things we observe, can we actually build into theories that we can test and then use those theories to discover new phenomena Right. And in the context mm -hmm. of aliens, like you want to, or origins of life, you know, the ultimate standard for me, understanding what life is, is we can go in the lab and we can build a physical simulator of a planet that generates de novo a life form. Um, or if we go to look for aliens, like we actually have a tool to be able to detect them without them looking at all like us. Well, what if, what if what is objective to us here, which I don't, I don't really yeah. disagree. Um, what if what's objective here at another dimension of reality is no longer the truth anymore, or it's not even that it's that it's actually more complex and we don't quite even maybe see the whole, yeah. the whole truth of it. You know, like we only understand a fractal of the nature of an objective truth in this reality. I mean, I think that's already true to an extent. Like I, I couldn't fathom looking around the room right now and thinking that my eyes and my ears and my nose and my, my ability to feel physical contact are actually capturing even a small slice of things that exist in this room right now. But mm -hmm. I, like, I'm a physical structure with sensory apparatus that you know, allows me to perce perceive certain features of reality, but not all of them. Um, and and again, this, this goes back to like, why I'm so fascinated by, um, that, like what technology has, like the evolution of technology is like a very, um, uh, interesting window into this kind of physics. Right. So, so basically I'm, I'm saying all these things that seem kind of intuitively obvious, but they're not intuitively obvious from the perspective of physics or how to construct theories that would explain these features. But, um, but the example from technology I like is like, you know, people will sometimes speculate with me that, well, aliens could be in this room right now, but you wouldn't know because they're living in a different dimension or they're doing something. And I would just say, well, that might be true, but how do I build the test for that? And then how do I actually look at that? And you can look at the history of life on earth. Um, and, you know, there's microbes, you know, probably all over everything I'm touching right now. Right. And I don't, I can't see them. I don't have any perception of them, but you know, we invented microscopes and then we just turned them on our tabletops and our bread. And we realized the, you know, the entire planet is basically littered with not littered. I mean, they're, they're thriving and they're wonderful and beautiful and they, they help us be here too. microbes. Right. So we have life all around us. That is, you know, it's just, it's not something that we have direct perception of it. We might taste, taste the bread is moldy or see the bread is moldy, but did you know that it was actually organisms growing there that are alive? An alien. 
You're eating an alien. Pretty much. I mean, it's alien in the sense that it's very distant in time from you on the same branch of life that emerged on our planet. Right. So, um, so my point with, with this example is of course, what you're saying, like in the far future, they probably will see more of reality than we do because we're going to invent things that allow us to see more of it. And I think AI is Mm -hmm. actually really important in this regard, artificial intelligence, because for me, our artificial intelligence might actually be the kind of technology that we develop that allows us to see the physics of ourselves. We, we built telescopes that allow us to see deep in the universe, microscopes that allow us to see microbes, you know, gravitational wave detectors that allow us to see these tiny ripples in the fabric of space time. Um, But we don't know what we look like, um, you know, fundamentally or have things that can recognize phenomena like us. And I think it's because of this, this, I would say in in assembly theory, because we are these very large causal structures that have this very deep embedding in time. And we don't have instruments that do that. But if you think artificial intelligence is like a map of our minds that we're projecting onto technology, then maybe it it will have different ways of seeing. I mean, we can teach it to have different ways to see the world than we do. And maybe it will be able to see that physics very clearly. I don't know. I'm I'm totally speculating right now, but that's an interesting way to look at it. I mean, that's an interesting way to look at it. I've thought to myself, even just with AI, that, you know, AI it's only it's it's limitations of learning are only what we all know. It's just collectively essentially put into one thing, one being. So it kind of creates a lineage of thought of the ultimate question is, are we just a version of AI, right? That we create the next sort of hyperhuman that collects all the information and then it just kind of keeps leapfrogging. Is right. that um, what do you think to that? Um, I, th- I think, I think what you're proposing is interesting. I would, I would say it a little bit differently. So I don't, I don't think thinking of AI as a monolith, like, you know, it's like one entity we're building is the right narrative. I think it's a, um, it's a collection, a population, a globally, you know, just like humans are distributed globally and we're all different. We all have different personalities and different intellects and yeah. different abilities to, you know, some people have synesthesia. So they, you know, like, like our minds all work differently. Right. So I, and I love examples of people that have minds that aren't, you know, like they're more than one or two standard deviation from the norm because they see things that other people don't, or they see connections between things other people don't. Um, but if you think about that as like AI, as a population of algorithms that are currently on the planet, you know, they, they will have personalities and attributes that are different from each other and they will behave cooperatively or antagonistically with each other. And so it's, it's more like a co-evolution, a cooperative, like, just like life has been. Um, it's mm-hmm. not, it's mm-hmm. not like a, I, I don't, I, I, I think of much, much more interesting cooperative collective effects okay. and complexity than these kind of, you know, it's all about the individual and survival of fittest. And, you know, like, I just think those things long-term are not the right. So if it's kind of the feedback loop and growing evolutionarily, and it takes a community and it takes information, we can't do it on, we can't do it in a silo. We have to have information. Then is it just um, a larger aggregate of of a community. It's just instead of, because essentially into an artificial intelligence, it's getting the encyclopedia, it's getting every Google search, it's getting, but of course it's not going to get every little, every bit from the world, right? Like not every AI is going to be, so it's going to just be essentially like, instead of having 8 billion people, now essentially there's like eight people or whatever, 800 that are smaller. It's a, it's a, it's a larger aggregate of, uh, it's an aggregate of a, of a, of a mass. Does that make, am I making sense? I didn't understand the last part. So maybe you can explain that idea a little bit more. So just that if we create an AI here, you know, I don't know, uh, Elon Musk is creating one and, and it's going to collect a, you know, the data from the United States. Well, this is kind of like representative of this information. And so, because everything in the universe is information, right? Um, in some sense, yes. Um, so I've been a big proponent of the idea that information is fundamental in some sense in, in terms of explaining what we are. Um, but it's almost like I would go one level deeper and I'd say we have things that we talk about as information and we have things that, that we talk about as matter. And really the real problem is that there's something deeper than that where information and matter look like the same thing. 
what level would that be at? How far How's down? The structure? That's, that's, that's actually what, that, that's the structure of a, this assembly theory I'm trying to develop. It's, 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 it's basically about the, the relationship between things that exist, the causal relationship. So, so we see, we talk about matter and we think about elementary particles. Um, and I would say elementary particles and the kind of current physics we have um, is very explanatory for objects that don't exist in time because they're instantaneous objects. They have no memory associated to them. Um, and they're, they, if they exist in the universe, they're very easy for the universe to reproduce in the next moment. But things like us are deeply embedded in time. We have a very rich causal structure. Mm -hmm. and so that feature of our physics is not readily apparent unless you look, look across time and you can actually see that that's that's sort of a key feature. So a molecule is actually a structure that exists across time and, 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 and has a physical dimension in time. So, um, so whether that, that pans out or, I mean, obviously we have to test these ideas. So we're trying to build experiments that actually validate some of the predictions from a theory that's structured that way. But, but that would be sort of, um, I think an important implication of, of how to think about how would you recover standard physics versus what's happening when you get into the world of complex objects and why they look different. Can you explain to me what vacuum fluctuations are? <laughs> yeah, um, so the, it's the idea that if you have um, in quantum physics, if you just have like an energy and uh, you can actually spontaneously fluctuate um, matter antimatter matter pairs into existence. Um, and so, so that's kind of a, it comes out of these, um, uh, sort of the structure of quantum field theory and the way that we actually have to account for certain events of, in particle physics we see, it looks like there's this kind of cloud of particles that are constantly being generated out of the vacuum. That I think is very accurate for elementary particles. I think where it's not accurate is when people want to extrapolate that um, to say anything can spontaneously fluctuate out of the vacuum. And actually, you don't even have to go to quantum physics for that. I mean, when, um, when thermodynamics was invented in the 1800s, you know, uh, Boltzmann, who was a big developer of uh, thermodynamics, um, you know, came up with this idea that the entire universe might be a fluctuation, like a, a rare event of order out of disorder, right? Um, and, and so we see this kind of reoccurring theme um, in sort of different theories of physics. But I think it, again, it comes from the fact that you, you can't fluctuate an entire um, history into existence, or you would have to fluctuate the entire history. You can't just get a complex object for free. It couldn't come out of the vacuum though. Like particles could not. Particles can. Do particles make life? They do eventually. Yes. It's, but it's not a fluctuation at that point. It's a really, it's a deterministic causal structure that's generated. And then there's also this other issue that when you, when you fluctuate vacuums, they're always in matter antimatter pairs. So they quickly annihilate each other because they basically come into existence right next to each other and matter annihilates um, antimatter generates mm -hmm. the energy that they fluctuated out of. So what you'd have to do is actually have a mechanism for separating the matter from the antimatter. And then either the matter would have to evolve complexity or the antimatter would evolve com complexity. So if you want to go back to like, you know, the origins of the universe or things and try to talk about mechanisms of the universe um, emerging as some kind of, you know, in some multiverse scenario, or you have, I, I, I don't know what proposal you might want to do, um, you know, maybe, I, you know, at some point you have to explain the origin of everything. I'm concerned with the origin of us from a universe that has matter as we currently understand it in it. I'm just wondering what, what it, what it, what are we are at a base level? Sure. Sure. I think we all are. That's a good question. What, what are we at a base level? So sometimes I talk about life as being information that structures matter across space and time. Mm -hmm. If I wasn't, and so what when I think about it from that perspective, what we are mm -hmm. like as humans, which is to me the most interesting phenomena, might be very uh, anthropocentric, but I, I still think it's okay to ask questions about ourselves. Yeah, um, is we are um, a mechanism for the universe to explore the space of what could exist. Um, in the sense that we're a generative mechanism, like creating this possibility of things that that wouldn't exist without us existing. So that's again goes back to this part of being part of this causal chain of events. So so but we happen to be a very um, uh, probably the first structure, at least that's emerged on this planet that has, in some sense, um, a more universal understanding. And this goes to the idea of imagination, right? So I think of like biological evolution, most of biological evolution could draw on things that had happened on this planet in the past and use them to survive into the future. Mm -hmm. Now there's something mm -hmm. very unique about us as 
maybe conscious beings or us as things that have imagination and the capacity to build technology, that we can imagine things that have never happened in our universe. And as long as they're consistent with the laws of physics, energy conservation or um, charge conservation, these kind of things, then we can build them. Like we can make them exist. Um, and so, um, you know, I'm deeply interested with people that are Platonists, like, you know, believe that there's some separate world of mathematical pure forms that somehow interacts with the material world. And I guess the physics I'm interested in is the fact that we actually exist on that boundary because we're constantly generating things that can exist that haven't existed and they wouldn't exist without us doing that. Mm -hmm. And I don't think you need to go to some deeper level of thinking about, you know, the world as the universe as like some multiverse or something to explain that. I think that the most interesting thing is to start from us mm -hmm. from first principles and say, what is it that we're doing? And what is the structure of physics that would be necessary to accommodate us? And then you can go back and you can look at quantum physics and you can look at general relativity and you can say, how is it consistent with those theories? But, you know, we didn't start trying to build GR by starting from quantum physics, um, right? And now we have a problem of trying to come up with a quantum, a theory of quantum gravity, because those theories don't aren't actually compatible in certain regimes. And, but everybody wants to use those theories to explain, especially quantum physics, to explain us in our minds. Mm -hmm. And but they weren't designed for that. They were designed to uh, to um, to describe certain features of elementary particles. And I think the physics of us is even weirder. <laughs> um, if I could have put it like flip, quite bluntly, I think it's much more interesting than quantum mechanics is um, in terms of A, its explanatory power and B, what it tells us about reality and, and also the kinds of the kinds of features it has associated to it. Mm -hmm. um, but we don't have that theory yet. So I, I don't, but I don't want to explain us in terms of quantum mechanics because I think it's yeah. boring and I think it's not, mm -hmm. um, it's, it's not nearly creative enough. I love that. What are your thoughts about ancient civilizations and the theory of ancient technologies? And when you look at the, you know, I don't know if this is necessarily so in your exact sort of studies and what you research, but it must play a part in your imagination about yeah. what could be because of what has been. Yeah. I, um, I was talking with my mom about this last night, actually, because oh. um, my, my mom, uh, she has very sort of different viewpoints. Like, like I said, she's an artist and she's, um, she's deeply Catholic and, you know, and I was kind of raised in this kind of, um, uh, you know, she's very spiritual. It's, it's so she's I, religious I, or she's spiritual, spiritual. Um, so I, I, it was interesting because she was, she was asking me this question about ancient civilizations mm -hmm. and, and I think the thing for me that's challenging is a lot of times there's a tendency for us to want to have mystical explanations for things. And I don't have a problem with being open minded. Um, and I, I don't necessarily have a problem with mystical explanations. But I think what I would prefer is an act, like a, a concrete explanation that allows us to do things. So I so this is actually like you could distinguish magic from knowledge in some sense in that magic is something that like a single person can talk about. Knowledge is something that an entire uh, planetary uh, civilization can actually use to, to move into the future. Um, and I think um, there has been a lot of, you know, localized knowledge or things that were invented that didn't become, you know, global scale integrated technologies. And, and I guess my point with ancient civilizations is they had this like effectively the same neural architecture we have today. If we could invent something, they could invent something. But the, the point is that their technologies were limited or they bifurcated off in different ways because they don't have the same sort of history of the evolution of technology we do, which is technology is very historically contingent. So, so my mom wanted to try to impose that there's some unexplained thing there. And I wanted to say, I think humans are the most amazing generative mechanisms that the universe has produced so far. So to sell ourselves short and say ancient cultures couldn't have done these things and we need some other explanation to me is selling short the potential for humans in the future and what we actually are capable of because it's just saying we couldn't do that. And I, and I don't, I don't see anything I've, I've seen people try to explain, um, mystically that I wouldn't want to attribute to our own minds um, and try to. And so and it doesn't mean that there aren't other things that could be interacting. It's just that I feel like as a first principles and the fact that I, I think we're amazing. Like yeah. I, I just, I can't, I can't 
So, um, so I think, I think we need to study history. I think we need to understand it better. I think there are definitely mysteries and there are some things that, you know, border the profound or border, you know, things that we don't understand. And I guess where I want to sit personally is on the frontier of trying to understand the things we don't understand, um, and do it from the perspective of science, because I think, I think personally, I think science is really amazing because it's the one place where you're always supposed to ask questions and you're not ever supposed to have the answer. And I think a lot of people always want to claim they have the answer. And I find that really challenging for me personally, because I know how few answers we uh, actually have to anything that we want to ask. At this point in time, we think that the, we, I mean, when you look at the universe and it being 95% dark energy and dark matter to get, right. That's just code for, I don't get it. Right. Yeah. It's, it's a very particular code for, I don't get it, but it is, it's like a placeholder for, we know the properties of that thing, but we can't explain that thing. Yeah. So So that could apply for ancient civilizations that we don't get it. There's an answer. We, this is a placeholder. We've got the pyramids and we've got pyramids all over the world and we've got all these stories and things like that. And we just don't get it right now. And it didn't mean that we weren't a part of it, but could it also mean that there was a part of ancient history that involved extraterrestrials being on this planet and assisting mankind? I don't think it's the most useful explanation. What else builds things that we can't even build now? Um, I, I don't know, you know, my kids build things I can't build. <laughs> um, so no, ser- I mean, seriously, I think it's severely underestimating, uh, you know, the power of the human mind. I mean, y- you look at anything that humanity's created, like language. I mean, who would think to invent language or geometry? It's just some of the, that knowledge stayed and some of it was lost with a particular civilization. And, you know, I would be, I would be, you know, if somebody wanted to make a convincing case for me about aliens, they should say aliens invented geometry. And like, there's, <laughs> I would be more shocked by actual knowledge, our, our biosphere, our the people we know we can point to generated than I would about some physical artifact that exists like a, a pyramid. I don't, I don't find those to be compelling evidence. I, you can think about it with life detection, right? So like people, they want to go out and find aliens and they think, um, you know, like, like evidence of UFOs is evidence of aliens, or they think finding phosphine on Venus is evidence of aliens. And to me, the evidence is not, not the thing. Like you don't want to make first contact with something that you don't understand. What we want to make first contact with when we're trying to understand aliens is the explanation. What is this phenomena that we're even talking about? So anytime people are making claims that it's ET, it's pretty much, we've put, Um, we've put a placeholder for other unexplained thing with aliens. And I think that that needs to be disentangled because we don't actually know the phenomena that we're talking about. And I don't want to jump to that as the first explanation. I actually want to understand what that thing is. And I, I think, I think we're capable of doing that. And I think part of the reason that I'm I'm giving you this sort of passionate response is I want to support people to think about the deeper problem than just kind of look at things and say, oh, it must be aliens because we don't understand it. Do you believe that everything is linear? I mean, is it that you're, I feel like there's a, there's a feeling that everything is, is working in a linear fashion and that. Oh no. It, like your point about time. Like, I don't think, I don't think like time, like I think time fundamentally time is ordering of events and they do move forward. But I, th- I think time is very complex. I don't think it, I don't think it's linear at all. So if you wanted to say, um, you know, could, could it, could aliens have visited us in the past? I'm not going to make the sort of standard argument that the distances in space and stuff are too large. I would just say, well, let, let's build the empirical test to do this. And in fact, my, my mentor here at, at, at ASU, Paul Davies, has proposed some of those kind of tests. So for example, if you think ancient aliens visited billions of years ago, not even like why, so the, the earth is 4 billion years old. Why would they visit 2000 years ago and not say one and a half billion years ago? Maybe they came 2 billion years ago and they missed seeing us and they, you know, so how would they leave a mark? Um, So, you know, he's come up with a proposal that's scientifically testable, which is a little bit crazy. Like it's a fishing experiment, right? Like this is really implausible, but you could at least test it, which is um, genomic study. Like, you know, we know genomes persist over time and there's certain information in genomes that has been on this planet as long as life has. So for example, how to build a ribosome, which is a molecular 
or machine in our bodies. Ribosomes have the same structure they had three and a half billion years ago, as far as we can tell. And that's encoded in DNA. So you can imagine if you had an extraterrestrial civilization come to earth and they wanted something to persist long enough for intelligence to evolve and decode it and say, hey, um, then maybe they would do it in genomes because genomes are more stable than rocks. Um, and so you can make these kind of proposals. And the way to test that is actually to go in genomic databases and try to look for codes and genomes. And people have done that, but they haven't come up with anything. Um, but so I guess it's, it's just, you know, there are a lot of just, there are a lot of like stories we can tell. We're really good at that. And mythology is really important for the progress of the human species. Our stories are like one of the most critical things that we do. But I think understanding the boundary of when are we talking about things that we can say concretely versus when are they the things that like, you know, we, we can't, then, then I want to be the person that's saying, well, how could we confirm that that's the right story? And, and I think we can do that with some of these things we could, but I don't see people that are, you know, I liked the, the Orion mystery about like, why are the chambers of, of the pyramids lined up with Orion, right? Like, how could they do that kind of astronomy? I think that's deeply fascinating, mm -hmm. but I, I think we can ask questions and try to find the answers. And if the answer is extraterrestrial, great, Yeah. but I don't, I don't see it being the first thing I want to, well, I actually, it is the first thing I want to run to, right? Cause I want to like prove aliens are real, but I also want to, I want to understand, um, well, I'm obviously going to ask you, I don't want to lose track of my thought here, if you believe aliens are real or not, but well, maybe it's a maybe because you're trying to prove it. Um, yeah. But there's like a an energy around magic kind of basically being not real, but there's a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot of things that we don't understand how they work. Yeah, right. Of course, and yeah. so it kind of almost goes back to the first question where there's an intuition, there's mm -hmm. a sort of pattern or an, an, an yeah. experience of reality that doesn't make sense yet, but you're observing it or you have a feeling about it or an intuition. And then you right. spend your time backing into figuring what the hell that thing is. Yeah, no, I think that's absolutely right. And I think, I mean, I do science by intuition. Yeah, there you go our brains are basically evolved to perceive reality, but they're real physical systems, right? So they're like the understanding of, of our universe is embedded in our brains, whether we can talk about it or not. Is it? What I mean by that is that we physically exist. And I think, I think we have a lot of deep intuition about things because of that. But, you know, I, that's my personal intuition. Now that may or may not be right. Right. Like, could I validate that, that statement? I don't know. Um, but I do know that I operate as a scientist by following my intuition about, does this feel like it explains phenomena? Does this feel like this is the right physics? And I, I love this thing about Einstein. It's like, there was some quote I came across once that like he could feel a light beam in his belly. Mm -hmm. And I think like, if you're, if you're really, you know, thinking deeply about the structure of some, like, like intuition can really guide you. But I, I think, um, you know, the, the challenge of being a scientist doing that is you really have to structure it. Like you have to be very disciplined in following your intuition, because I think, um, you know, part, part of it is, you know, I also, I don't want to just accept things as we've been taught, I really want to understand how things work. And I think there's sort of this dichotomy where some people want to take narratives that we've been told and use those to try to get people behind a certain set of stories. And I just think it's really important to empower people to realize that, you know, their intuition matters, their understanding matters. Um, and we really need to appreciate the diversity of human experience. And that probably in the long run will really help us understand more about what we are and what we're doing. So I, I completely resonate with that, that kind of viewpoint. Um, I have and to I go to the next level then and say, yeah, what yeah. do you believe intuition is? So I don't know exactly how to answer that question. I just, I, I think like uh, emotions can be a good guide um, for things. Um, and I know a lot of people that are brilliant, like some of the best scientists I know are super emotional about thinking. Like, like for me, it's a, it's a very emotional process. It's like, like how people would describe art mm -hmm. is what it's like to try to build new, like being artistic. So, mm -hmm. um, so I think, I think that's hugely important, but I also personally think like people think scientific theory should be the simplest explanation. And for me personally, I think if we want the explanation that's going to increase the longevity of life, basically, like, like makes the best possible future. And, and part of the reason I think that is because I think our intuition and the kind of ideas we build about reality are actually what generates the future for us. And so, um, because we're, we're building it, right. Yeah. <laughs> um, 
We yeah. decide to have children. We decide to make cars. I think from that perspective, intuition is kind of, it's sort of the steering, uh, at least that our minds have through, through what can exist and, and how we want to actually manifest what we want to. But to that be. doesn't really scientifically explain what intuition is. No, um, but I don't think it's impossible to explain what intuition is. Is in intuition kind of magic? No, but it may be, oh, in the sense that it's unique to a person, it might be. Well, and that it's also not explainable. Like, um, I don't think it's not, not explainable, but I do appreciate the, the perception. So there, there is this interesting question, which I think is where you you keep trying to push me and it's really hard because I'm really resisting it. Um, <laughs> but you know, you know, I'm open-minded enough to try to go there a little bit. So <laughs> it's good. Um, so, um, but, you know, there is, there is this really fascinating question about what is the boundary of what's knowable, right? Because we don't know, you know, like science has taken us far and we have, you know, an explanation of things or even literature has taken us far. Like I, I'm a scientist, I talk about science, but like you think about any human endeavor from art to sport to literature to religion, they have all expanded the boundary of what we think is possible or how we think about things. And the, the question is like, how much is really concretely knowable, which is kind of the, you know, and, and, and I think in science, that's a really hard question because we don't know how far the boundary of our understanding can go. We don't know the limitations of our own minds. We don't know the limitations of our physical, you know, like our physical architecture as, 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 you know, biological things. Mm -hmm. So, um, so I think that's a, a really deep question. Um, and I don't think it's one that's necessarily readily answerable. Um, I don't know if it'll ever be answerable. I kind of, I kind of see knowledge as this expand, expanding wavefront that like, as life has evolved, it's expanded its reach in terms of what it can explain and understand. And I, I don't necessarily see a limitation to that process because the space of what can exist is absolutely huge. I mean, people think physical space, like the physical size of the universe is large, but I like to point out that the number of molecules that could be produced on this planet based on like the amount of chemistry that we know or biology knows is like exponentially <laughs> really large. It's hard to compare a combinatorial space to like a geometric space, but it's just, it's huge. Yeah. And you don't have enough resources in the entire universe to make all possible uh, you know, proteins, which are, you know, a, a molecule in our body, you know, like a length 200 unit amino acid protein, you don't have enough resource in the universe to make all, all possible versions of that molecule. There's a lot of to the power of. Yeah, there's a, yes, there's a lot of to the power of, to the power, to the power of. <laughs> and so I just think when you get to things that are complex like us, that space is huge. And we don't think of that as a physical space, but what I'm trying to say in terms of constructing a physics of life is to think about the space of all the possible things that could exist as the actual landscape that you do that physics on. Yeah. And then we, we exist somewhere in that space of what could possibly exist, but we are particularly interesting things in that space because we're generative in that space. We generate more things mm -hmm. that possibly mm -hmm. exist. I was kind of just also mentioning something that you trust and use, but yet not proven. Like there's, yeah, no, that's Systems okay. That play I'm, that are beyond our awareness. They're beyond. Sure. They're we don't get them. We, but it doesn't yeah. mean that they aren't tried and true. It doesn't mean that they're our intuition. If we look back in time, we can see how good it is. But we don't know yeah. where the hell that comes from. Yeah, I suppose I see where you're going with that. I don't have a problem trusting my intuition and not knowing why I have the intuition. And I also, I mean, I th think it's also interesting because people underappreciate how much you think subconsciously. And so I think about myself as having a healthy dialogue between my conscious and subconscious is obviously like it's kind of a one-way conversation uh, because I'm only consciously aware of the conscious part. But what I mean by that is certain ideas, you know, like... I push them to the back of my brain and I just let them stay there. And suddenly, and then they come back and, you know, I have some new insights or some understanding that I kind of knew consciously all along, but I didn't always really know. And so I think the levels of like what our brains are doing and how they're processing information and how we use that to guide how we do creative things um, is deeply interesting. And currently we don't understand that. Um, and I'm okay. Like I'm okay with that in the pursuit of the kind of problems I'm interested in because well, um, it's the nature of your it field. It's the nature yeah. of your field that there's That's a whole it. lot of things that you're trying to answer. That's the job, right? So it doesn't surprise me that it's okay that you don't understand it. And, um, you know, maybe that'll be something that will be 
scientifically explained at some point in time. In science, suspending disbelief is sometimes really important, but that's true for any creative enterprise, right? So, you know, like there's certain things you were taught are true. And then you have to go out, like, I mean, I could talk about, I, I, I'm a physicist that thinks the second law of thermodynamics is wrong. Like the, that entropy should always increase in systems. Mm. And so that, like this idea that the universe isn't, like it should be increasing disorder. And that's just the directionality that time sets for things. Is and it I equally think that, increasing in order too? Uh, no, like the second law basically says it, it's so basically it comes from thinking about uh, like a, a gas of particles in a box. Um, and, you know, an ordered configuration might be you have all the particles in the corner of the box. And so they have a very localized location and, and there's very few configurations that you can stick all of them in the corner. But if you think about them evenly distributed, there's a lot of ways you could rearrange them all. And so that would be like a high entropy state. And so thermodynamics basically says that all systems should be increasing entropy over time. And there's mathematical arguments for that. And it's validated in all kinds of simple physical systems, but people want to apply that to the universe as a whole. So say the universe is going to a heat death in the long-term future or to the biosphere, like, you know, biology is somehow, you know, uh, temporarily averting the second law of thermodynamics by making ordered things. And I think it's a, it's a, it's an, it, there's a few problems with that. One is when you construct theories of thermodynamics, you have to talk about ensembles of identically prepared systems. So if you want to apply it to the universe, you have to say there's a whole bunch of universes that are identical and we're doing mm. statistics. And I don't think that makes sense. And, um, and it also depends on how you label states. So there's this issue in some theories of physics that the measurements you take kind of matter to the, the structure of what you get out. Um, and in that case, you know, if I, I, I might have a, you know, depending on what I can observe, I'll talk about maximum entropy over the observables, but you know, there, then if I observe more features, is it, you know, like, how do I, so there's this issue of constraints and observables and things that's really interesting in the way that we label things okay. <laughs> mathematically as the universe, the universe is expanding. I mean, that's just, that's happening, right? Yeah. So, so yeah, that's what dark energy is supposed so to be. If the universe is expanding, is that the opposite of entropy? No, um, it's different mechanisms. So, um, but that's actually good intuition um, that you have there. Because <laughs> I actually think that um, if you had the right theory of physics, it might be connected. So I, I have this colleague I work with, Lee Cronin, that's, um, uh, uh, you know, he's a polymath and a chemist and everything. And he told me his theory of dark energy was actually like time. And I thought it was the most ridiculous thing I ever heard in my entire life. But I actually, over the years working, because we work on this theory, assembly theory together, I've come to understand what he means. And he just means that time is a, a mechanism for generating um, like states in the universe. Mm -hmm. And so if time is moving forward, it's actually generating more states. So you, the universe mm -hmm. actually has bigger as time gets further. And that idea seems logically consistent. Now you'd have to go, you know, build a whole theory based on that, but that that's something that is kind of implicit in the theory that we're building to explain life. And that's also in a different way. The way I was thinking about it is that life is somehow like an entropy over paths rather than configuration. So what I mean by that is mm -hmm. if you think about the transformations on physical things, rather than counting the physical things you have in your system and where they are, that maybe life is somehow an entropy in that space. And both of those ideas are actually very closely related to what you suggested, hmm. but from different spectrums. Mm. So I think, I think we don't understand the relationship between our own ideas most of the time. Yeah. We have a lot to figure out. Uh, yes, so do you believe, do you, I mean, do you believe in aliens then? Um, so it's a hard word for me, believe. Well, um, but you, no, but, but I mean that in a, a way, like I, I'm somebody that always wants to believe I have an open mind. I have a lot of, um, uh, but, but I think, I think what I, I would like to prove they exist. Um, I don't know if they do or not. And I think like for me, based on the, the sort of evidence in, in, in science is, you know, we don't have uh, concrete evidence one way or the other, whether alien life exists or not. And some people might cite the point you made earlier that life emerged very early on earth. We're here. Uh, very early, very quickly, right? So that might suggest the origin of life is easy to happen. Um, and people have made this argument, but there is also the issue that if the origin of life didn't happen quickly on our planet, we might not be here to be talking about that having happened because we wouldn't have had the necessary time to actually even evolve to have the conversation about the origin of life. So there's this issue when you, when you, it's called post-selection, when you actually look at the end state and you're trying to explain the likelihood of the origin, it's conditionally dependent. Um, and so when people actually do proper statistics on that, it comes out that 
it, it could be that life is completely common in the universe based on a rapid origin of life on earth, or it's totally uncommon. We just don't have enough constraints because we're contingent on like we wouldn't exist without that having happened. So it could be really rare and we could just happen to be the people they're observing. It's a, it's a generalization. Of the, well, it's not, it's a, it's a specific case of the anthropic principle, which is this idea that the universe might be fine tuned for life out of the multiverse. And we just happen to find ourselves in this particular universe, but specifically for the problem of the origin of life. They've proven that there are like 40 billion planets that have habit are habitable based on certain biological factors that we have, correct? Right. But habitable is debatable, right? So sure. habitable. Oh, yeah. I mean, I don't want to live in the Sahara. Yeah. I mean, like, you exactly. Know. So um, <laughs> I don't either, even though I live in, <laughs> even though we live um, almost <laughs> in the Sahara. Yeah, almost, just not quite. Um, but also, um, so so that that's one issue. Habitable, habitable for whom? Sure, it would all have the same habitability conditions because that's a pre like a precondition for life. But we don't know what life is, and we don't know what it depends on. And then the second is we don't actually know. Uh, we don't have any constraints right now on the likelihood of matter transitioning to life. I mean, that's the origin of life problem. We don't have an answer to that problem. So we can't constrain the likelihood of that event happening elsewhere in the universe because we don't have a theory or the, the actual mechanisms. We don't understand how that happens. So I, 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 a lot of my astrobiologist colleagues are very, you know, willing to, um, to point out that life should be common because plant habitable plants are common. And it's sort of a common thing people say, but I, I just, I, it could be the case, but I don't want to say it is the case because we don't know. Do you believe then that, you know, cause we were talking about it for quite a while, but consciousness that it's sort of an epiphenomenon of humans, or do you think that there is a way that that becomes the neural link to everything or other things even? start with saying, I don't think, I don't think that theories for physics that start from consciousness as the fundamental thing actually could work. Um, so I don't think you can start from consciousness being the thing that exists before everything else and then have things work. I think consciousness is something, some other kind of physics generated potentially. If we don't come in with it, you're saying it's saying as humans, there was some point in time where all of a sudden we had consciousness. Um, I think it's much more gradual. I don't believe like, I, I don't think that things are alive or not alive. I think it's much more of a continuum. And I think consciousness to a degree has some of those features, but I guess the question is like, what would be the first experience? Or maybe it is abrupt. Like you, you either have experience or you don't. Um, and of course there's, there's people that think everything experiences, but I, I think that would be really hard to, uh, demonstrate empirically, uh, you know, like, so I, I think the question is, what becomes the better explanation that explains more of things and allows you to predict more things or to generate more things? Is it unique to humans or do you think that consciousness has this uh, a reach beyond us? I think it's potentially the latter. I think it's hard to talk about that. So like for me personally, a lot of my conscious experience is cast in the form of language. So a lot of my thoughts are in language, like the ones I'm consciously aware of. I have a hard time. Um, like I can visualize things, but I, I, you know, I can't, I have, a, can't have a conscious experience of taste. That's, that's separate from, uh, mm -hmm. actually tasting something. So like, there's, there's certain things, you know, everybody's architecture, their mind is slightly different. So like, I have friends that don't are like their conscious experience or the way they think about things is not in language at all. And they have a hard time translating their thoughts into like a dream. Think about a dream. I mean, you wake up yeah, in the morning exactly. and you're like, so yeah. I, w and then you think it, you're visualizing it so perfectly, but then you try and explain it and it eludes yeah, you. Exactly. Yeah. So, but, but I also think that we under, so we put so much emphasis on our conscious experience that we don't always think about what the subconscious is doing. And, and for me, I, personally, I think my subconscious is doing most of the heavy lifting, even in my intellectual, like day-to-day -day existence, because yeah. of the way ideas come into my mind and how long I know that they've been sitting in my brain without, you know, and people will talk about those creative moments or sleeping on an idea. And then suddenly everything cl clicks in the picture. So, so I guess from that perspective, you I don't think that comes from the subconscious. I think so. Yeah. I mean, I like the, like, I mean, if you're not aware of it, you don't experience it. Right. It's technically not your consciousness. Right. But some things might come connected to something else. Um, like I just interviewed Bruce Lipton and he is like, I mean, like, I don't know who that is. Oh, he's Sorry. a, he's a scientist or he's a 
he's a doctor. He studied genetics and then he studied the phenomenon. He realized what epigenetics was and he understood yeah. how genes have an expression. And the conversation was about the subconscious and the conscious and that the subconscious oh, is the programming and that yeah. the conscious mind is sort of the creative, intuitive mind and that the subconscious right. is the program. Yeah. Sort of operates yeah. how we walk. It's how we talk. Yeah. I kind of think about it that way, but I actually, I think most of the creativity happens subconsciously. And for most creatives, I think that's true. Actually, Henry Poincaré, who's a very famous mathematician, had this wonderful essay on how mathematical ideas are created. And he really talked about this like combinatorial space in like that, you know, you're not like thinking and aware of where all the ideas are recombined and then they come back up to your conscious, like, and then you can think of the mathematical idea or whatever it is. But I think for most people that are really creative, I, I think we have very little awareness of what we're doing creatively, like in our, in our conscious experience when we're doing it. Mm. Um, so, I mean, it goes back to like, you, you asked me this question very early on about thinking about, you know, when did I know what I was doing, <laughs> you know, cause it takes a lot of experience, but you know, the way that I experience that personally is I'll say things for years. And then suddenly I'll have a moment where I'm like, I really understand why I was saying that for years. Yeah. Um, yeah. And it's because the depth of understanding, I think, you know, I might, you, you know, I, I had some understanding of it, but I wasn't, you know, necessarily as clearly understanding in my conscious experience, like in the way I could articulate it in language um, of what was hap what I was thinking as I became over time, because it takes a long time to process complex ideas. Um, and you think and that I, that was, and you think that that is a, just an intelligent moment of understanding something to some degree, but not all the way and not something sort of in the field or through intuition that is beyond our experience that we can understand here scientifically yet. Um, I guess I, I would, I would again be sort of halfway stance. Like I don't think the, the way that you're describing it is necessarily incorrect, but I would not use those words to describe it. Um, and what I mean by that is like, um, I think, I think we're picking up information all the time. Mm -hmm. So every interaction you have with a person, I mean, people will talk about body language and sure. things and you're reading all these things that are just not in the verbal report that they're giving you. Um, and they're also, I mean, in the pandemic, we all suffered so much because we were isolated from each other, but like just being in the room and being creative with a person in three dimensions, like there's just more information and more, um, like there's just more capacity to really understand what the other person is saying. And so I guess for me, I think, um, I feel like when I'm doing science, one of the things that I do is I like to survey what everybody's thinking. Like, so I try to listen to what all, all the people in a particular field are saying, and I try to look at what they're say all saying, but not saying with words. Mm -hmm. But what I mean by that is they are saying it with words and they think they're saying those things, but it goes back to the fact that language is imprecise and they're all actually talking past each other slightly. And it's almost like, it's like science is like a mosaic to me. There's like one picture of reality that we have with all the pieces in it. And then you can just look at it and you can be like, oh, there's a completely different painting here. And so you just rearrange all the pieces and then you see it, you have the same pieces, but there's a totally different picture. And I, I think, I think when people have intuition or they're, they are seeing things other people aren't seeing, but I think it's just because you know, like all of our minds work differently and, and we can intuit different things and we look at different patterns. Um, and I think that's really important. Um, but I, I, and, and maybe we don't understand all the features of how that works yet. Mm. Um, and I'm okay with that. I'm curious what the, what is the, um, main question that you hope to answer, um, to have answered in this lifetime? Maybe you, maybe you're a part of the final, you're always going to be a part of the final answer. Maybe it comes while you're still in your job, but what is the question you hope that we can have a solution or a formula for? I love this question. I always tell my students that I want to know what life is before I die. So we all have to work <laughs> but I mean, I really mean like what we, I want to know what we are. I want to know how life arises in the universe. And I want to know if, you know, what, it, what is the variety of phenomena that are like us? Um, I, I really, I, I just, 
you know, like I'm always mystified by like people want to look at the stars and say like, the stars are so amazing. There's so many of them out there. Isn't it great? And I'm just like, look at you comprehending what a star is. Aren't you the most amazing physical thing in the universe? Like, I mean, just like, if you think about like the, the magnitude of the phenomena that exists on this planet, just encapsulated in human minds, it's just, it's absolutely profound. And, um, and I just, I, I really think if I think about you know, the long-term future for us, I think at a certain point, we really have to understand ourselves at a deeper level to understand the context of like, even what's happening on this planet. Now, if you think yeah. about existential threats and things like we have to know what we are, that we're not going to know where we're going. I agree with you. I hope that I hope it's coming as soon as possible. Me too. Thanks everybody for listening to the pretty intense podcast today. I hope you enjoyed it. If you like what you heard today and you want to hear more, please click on the subscribe button.